Fantastic to be here. We are starting a little late. I'm told that I still get my hour and a quarter. Then that sounds an awful long time for you to sit and listen. So let me just tell you the plan. Please do sit and listen. I kind of concerned with you guys standing at the back. I would have backache. Anyway, up to you. Um, uh, we'll start. I've told you what I'm going to do, right? You, you probably don't need me to guide you through, actually. You could do this Bible study by yourselves, right? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, over three sessions, closer, deeper, wider. And today, uh, well, rather this morning, session one, we're looking at verses 14 through 17 in a moment. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this afternoon, we'll do... 18 and 19, have I got my numbers right? And then tomorrow we'll do 2021. 20, um, so for the hour and a quarter, here's my plan. It might change, but here we go. I'd like to start with Alexio Divina together of those first three verses. I'm hoping you read the lot so you've got a bit of a context for the first three verses. I have never done Alexio Divina in a collective this size but I find that really exciting and interesting, yeah? So, uh, and then, so I'm imagining that'll take 10 minutes, then I will talk for about 45 minutes, but with a break in the middle somewhere, I promise you, I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk about what we're talking about, okay? And then at the end, I'm gonna leave 15 minutes, if I get my timing better than Bishop Brewer managed. <laughs> Uh, I'm not competing with him. I'm, I'm confessing up front that I could be worse than him. You know, when bishops get speaking, it's really hard to switch them off. I remember saying, I'm just going to speak for two minutes. And then I looked at my watch 10 minutes later, and I hadn't realized how long I'd been speaking for. Do you ever have that problem, or is it just bishops? It's just bishops. Jolly good. Anyway, so my hope is then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So, you know, you keep your questions rolling on that QR code. Uh, and for those of you online, I hope you've got that QR code too. It'd be fantastic to have questions from beyond the room, so to speak, wherever and whoever you are. But tell us who you are and where you are, because that's kind of interesting. Okay, should we pray before we start? Uh, and when it comes to the Lexio, I'll read the text for the first time slowly, uh, and we will share silence together as we work out where and how God is speaking to us in those three verses. And then we will hear those three verses read again. I'm going to ask Bishop Patrick to read them so you hear them in a different voice and a different accent from a different place. Because I believe it takes the whole people of God to listen to the whole word of God. And Patrick is not the whole people of God, but he represents a different, <laughs> yeah, you get that. And then after Bishop Patrick has read those verses a second time, I'm going to invite you to call out the word, the phrase that jumps out for you I don't know how many people are here, 80, 90, 100 people. We're not going to manage that from everyone. So if your little piece is read out, it may not need repeating, but I'll just leave that to your judgment. And if we call out at the same time, hey, we'll work it out without falling out, right? Maybe we'll hear multiple voices. I, I just apologize to the people online. I have no idea how to do Lexio online without a chat function. So um, maybe that can be part of your question or even answer <laughs> through the QR code. So I apologize on that one. And from there, we'll move into the Bible study. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Let's pray. Lord, we turn to your word because we expect you to speak to us. And we long to hear your voice to take it on board, whether it's a word of encouragement or challenge or both, we ask that your spirit would use your word to transform our lives and conform them to your glory. For Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Okay, thank you. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth drives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Is sabab se mes baap ke aage gutne take down. So feel free to speak up where you hear the Lord speaking into your ear.
Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. into global family. Members of the church seen and unseen. bend the knee of our heart. Father, everything in us. Mm -hmm. Let grace be all sweet to love you and do to you. Lord, live through you. Thank you, everyone. I think we've pretty much covered those three verses between us, have we not? I think I've heard almost every word called out from among you. So um, at the risk of being predictable, I'm gonna go through those three verses, kind of exegetically, if you like. Um, I, I hope you'll have ears particularly for the part where the Lord is already speaking, and I, I trust he will speak to all of us according to our need. And that as he speaks, it will strengthen you and me even better than lying on that beach in Barbados. <laughs> now, this is not just a Bible study here. As somebody said to me last night, we are being invited to a prayer meeting here, led by St. Paul, okay? And this is how St. Paul prays. What a privilege. We might say, so how does he pray? You know, what does he pray for us? A and then secondly, we might say, how does he pray? How does that speak to the way we pray? At the very least, I just want to say he's not praying for a parking place here. <laughs> <laughs> I, have an on, I have an ongoing little um, tiff with a friend on this one who, whenever I'm with her in the car, she's always, you know, and we're going someplace, she prays for a parking place. And every time I sigh, and every time she gets the parking place, <laughs> But I sigh, not because I think God doesn't listen to our every prayer and our every need, but I think because there are some bigger prayers that should come first, <laughs> okay? And, and I think in her life, the big prayers do come first. So she knows I respect her deeply, but I am still embarrassed about praying for a parking place. <laughs> you know, that level of self-interest well, I do think God can deal with our self-interests as God sees fit, but you know, there are other people's interests that may need to come first. Anyway, that's my own little personal relational issue there. Let's start with for this reason. I mean, it, 
Paul's had a few digressions. It's like he says, now where was I? Oh yes, he was about to explain what he prays for. But first he wanted to explain on whose behalf he prays and then what leads him to prayer. And then here at last, we've come to the prayer itself. So for this reason, repeat the exact phrase at the beginning of chapter three. It's the same Greek. For this reason, he began, I pull the prisoner, the prisoner of Christ for you Gentiles. So we're carried back to the great mercy of God to the Gentiles, which is what Paul was expounding in chapter two, in fact. That is the basis of the apostles' prayer. That is the basis for Paul's own mission in declaring God's mercy afresh here from prison. It doesn't matter where he's praying from, but he's praying from prison. In other words, to pray this prayer is costly. And the basis for the sufferings that have accompanied that mission. The basis for the sufferings, chapter 2, verse 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived according to those, following the desires of the flesh. But God, but, it's the great but that interrupts history. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great, the great love with which he loved us. And then Paul's sentence goes on forever in chapter two because he gets carried away about the mercy of God. Okay, that was chapter two. Now we're finally getting back to the prayer in chapter three and then he tells us he's in prison and he tells us from where he's praying and why he's praying. And finally, chapter, uh, chapter three, verse 14, we get to the prayer itself. Oh yes, where was I? For this reason... I kneel before the Father. Now, literally, the language is, uh, I bow my knees to the Father. For me at the moment, that language of bowing the knee echoes Black Lives Matter, right? Does that, is that true for you in this country or is it just in Britain that became the, the catchphrase? For, soccer players bowed the knee before our big matches started. We did, we gathered, actually it was illegal during COVID, but, but, but the passion in Britain, uh, kindled by those events, horrific events in Minneapolis, was such that we all gathered, socially distanced of course, with our masks on, oh, to bow the knee. We bowed one knee, that became the symbol. Was that true here? Yeah. I may, okay, good, good, good. I wonder if bowing the knees, two knees here, sounds normal to you when it comes to Paul praying. If it sounds normal, I beg to tell you, in Paul's culture, it was not normal at all. Jews stand to pray, yeah? Sometimes Episcopalians stand to pray. Right? Yeah. The idea of kneeling in prayer is rarely mentioned in the New Testament, and in, in any case, the phrase isn't the normal one. Standing to pray was the norm. Think of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Yeah? <laughs> kneeling was expressive of an unusual emotion. Jesus, above all, in Gethsemane. Stephen, just before he's stoned. Sorry, before his martyrdom. Do I need to explain stoning? <laughs> I would in Britain. I don't know if that's an idiom here or not. <laughs> okay, I love it when the laugh kind of ripples later. <laughs> it was only as I said it that I thought to myself, unfortunate language choice there. Okay, um, 
Paul at his farewell on the beach with the Syrian disciples before heading to danger in Jerusalem. What do these events have in common? Um, trauma, <laughs> commitment, passion, the kind of passion that brings suffering. Um, in Gethsemane, in Luke, you've got Jesus kneeling down. In Mark, you've got he threw himself upon the ground. And in Matthew, you've got he fell upon his face. The phrase here is found again only in a quotation from 1 Kings 19. That's the story of Elijah at Horeb with the prophets at Baal. And the fear is that they bow the knee to Baal. Okay? It's repeated in Romans 11.4 if you're interested. And there are also allusions from Isaiah 45 again to bowing the knee to idols. And thus in Philippians 2, that hymn of Christ's self-emptying, you know the one? I have sworn by myself, declares the Lord, that unto me every knee shall bow. Isaiah 45, quoted again in, in Philippians 2 verse 10. In other words, we're too good at bowing the knee elsewhere. Yeah? But we don't readily enough bow the knee to God. So the kneeling probably doesn't refer to an upright position, but kneeling and bowing with the head touching the ground. We're talking about prostration, the sign of deepest reverence, and you might even say humiliation. Somebody said submission. Originally associated not so much with prayer as with homage. So it's a posture, uh, incidentally, it's a posture that was forbidden in the early church on Sundays and in the Easter season because it signifies penance. And rather in Easter, we should be filled with joy and thanksgiving. Okay, so Paul kneels before the Father, and that is a strong statement. And who does he kneel before? Not idols, but before the Father. When this prayer first began in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul spoke of the Father of glory, chapter 1, verse 17. Let's just think for a minute about the language Paul is using of God. And in particular, all of the references to the fatherhood of God. At the very beginning, Paul says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says much the same thing at the very end of the book of Ephesians. And then the rest of chapter one, you get his great doxology, opening with the words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that title gets developed and emphasized again a little later on in chapter one, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. In chapter two, he uses the name absolutely, speaking of our access to the Father. Then it follows with the significant phrase, the Father of the household of God. And then we come to the description here, which is expanding and interpreting the title, The Father of Glory. And in the next chapter, Paul goes on to develop the absolute and universal aspect of the fatherhood, still with further words, the one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. Finally, he urges Christians to give thanks always for all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to him who is God and Father. Chapter 5, verse 20. Okay, there's a lot about the fatherhood of God in Ephesians. Now, I know some people have real hesitation about the language of father for God, whether for ideological reasons or personal reasons perfectly valid personal reasons. 
but I want to put it to you. Do you glimpse something of what we might be missing if we only use the term God? Paul is using the term father because he's excited, which is to say, Paul, that brilliant scholar and Jew, has discovered something new about God, which is the truth of the divine fatherhood, because it is revealed to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ, the one he met on the road to Damascus, the one who is the son of the father. So talk here about closer. I dare say that Paul, as Saul in his former life, a very faithful Jew, could have given you a good few Bible readings on the nature of God. <laughs> a good few lectures, perhaps, just like you did in seminary and then you wrote those papers, right? God is revealed throughout the Old Testament as creator and covenant maker, as shepherd, as redeemer, as warrior, as king, as shepherd and even as servant. Isaiah, Isaiah, you've picked up my accent by now. <laughs> you say Isaiah, I say, uh, yeah, okay. How God speaks and the world comes into being. Stars come into being. How he calls and trusts his people to lead on his behalf. How he promises and plans yet improvises continually to bring about his promises. How God persists with flaky people and shaky people <laughs> to fulfill his purposes with them and through them. I mean, it's ridiculous that God does that. I mean, it'd be so much easier for him to click his fingers. But God chooses to work through flaky, shaky people. But can you hear, hear God, uh, Paul's new discovery? Just, just get excited with me. He's encountered Jesus, so he's come to know God even better. Yes, God is all those oms and ims, omniscient, omnipotent. Uh, I can't remember all the ims. You can help me later. <laughs> Imminent, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, but if there's God the Son, whom Paul met in person... God the Son means there's God the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one to whom, through Christ, we have access, who sustains a household, the one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Can you hear Paul's understanding of the Trinity emerging? You know, tick, tick, tick. The pieces are coming together because Paul has met the person of Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, whose father Paul realizes is already, he already knows as the God of Israel. Yes, the God of the Old Testament is absolutely the same as the God of the New Testament. No, please, no preaching to say the Old Testament God is angry and the New Testament God is merciful. Please read your Old Testament again. <laughs> God can get angry in the New Testament too. Okay, there's no inconsistency. There's just more knowledge, deeper insight, greater intimacy, closeness, because of the access that is given to us to God the Father through Jesus the Son. I wonder if I can just throw out a pastoral challenge to those who have an issue with the fatherhood of God. Please don't leave it behind forever. My advice, I, I had a student come to me recently about this, who, you know, for very good reasons, having been abused by her father, found it really difficult to name the fatherhood of God. So I said, give yourself a break. You know, you can find other language, you can use parent, it seems a bit generic to me, but if that works, or mother, there's, there's precedent for that in scripture as we know. But I said, please pray that you don't 
leave out that language forever. Please, please pray that having had a break from it, and yet seeing it and recognizing the fatherhood of God, you might come to a bigger understanding of fatherhood that reaches, you know, it's not about your father. It's about God. And God will out-narrate the experience, the dreadful experience of fatherhood you have otherwise known. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. There's something very literal going on here. The Greek word for family is derived from the Greek word for father. So this phrase is demonstrating by its terminology what it is describing. I think there's a technical name for that and someone can tell me afterwards. E every patriar is derived from the pater. You with me? Our language, I don't think, is adequate to translate it. But in the old days, we might have said, the father from whom all fatherhood is named. The problem is that that implies something specific about fathers over mothers that is not implied here. It's not gender-based here. It's not something sexist, okay? It's not a gender statement. It's an ontological statement. Without the first person of the Trinity, the Trinity family, there is no human family, okay? The family, as we know it, biologically in the sense of parents and children, or theologically in the sense of the church, the body that is related through baptism, that family is because God is. That is what is going on here, okay? We are parented and we are parents because God is parent to us all. And Paul means all. I can't say that the right way, all. <laughs> As you know, I lived in North Carolina for seven years and I learned Southern, okay? So I learned, then you say y'all. <laughs> Am I getting that right? Y'all. And then when you get really excited, you say all y'all. I never kind of understood that. That's a tautology to me. But it, if it works for you, okay, to get the message that God is being completely inclusive here, completely inclusive here, every family in heaven and on earth. Some of you repeated that. Whether you're happy to call God Father or not, whether you acknowledge God or not, whether you are on earth or in heaven. I heard someone else voice that bit. God is your father. I wonder if we can pause to try to comprehend just how inclusive this is. Those online, as well as those in this room. Where are you online? I know there's Wynn in Michigan. For all I know, there's some uh, Archbishop Moses in Bohr. Does he know, do we, anyway, I don't know how far we reach. Central Florida, I just know, is, goes way beyond Central Florida. Hallelujah. Just so inspiring to, to glimpse your international connections here, to pray for some of them at morning prayer this morning, to pray for some of them that go way beyond the Anglican communion cycle of prayer. My goodness, I was challenged by that. Thank you. Can we pause to understand just how inclusive God is? I suspect we cannot. We're just too small-minded. We can't get over ourselves. We spend our whole time looking over our shoulder to see where God is working, either limiting or defining the sphere of God's action as we do so, when that sphere is limitless. Now, I know inclusion is a big issue. It's a big issue in society, just as it's a big issue in the church. It's used politically, isn't it? I, I, I think here we have a theological definition that needs to out-narrate that. 
but it's used in election campaigning. Jeez, did you notice, by the way, we have a new prime minister in Britain? Just <laughs> while I slept last night. And some of you will say without any election at all. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You can query our democratic credentials. I'm just glad we have one right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we also start talking about inclusion when it comes to our hot button issues. Why? Because there is exclusion. Because there is favoritism and inequality. Because even those of us that talk democracy till we're blue in the face don't live it. Yeah? Because when we get overwhelmed, we reach for our safe small group and we become tribal. Do we not? All of us. Because there are minorities and majorities, because there is power that is unevenly distributed. But God's inclusion is radical. And I'm not sure on a human level we are capable of comprehending it. We'll come back to that, you know, we're coming tomorrow to God imagining what we cannot imagine, okay? But it, 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 the seeds of it are right here. God's inclusion is radical. So Paul reminds us, stretches us, reassures us all the time. Democrat and Republican, Anglican and Episcopal, if indeed they're different. Deacons and priests, clergy and laity. After Bishop Brewer this morning, I want to say global south and westerners. And I also want to say colonials and colonized. And my goodness, that is very complicated in a post-colonial, so-called, era. And I just want to say on that one, thank you. I know, I know that even the voice from which I speak, you know, you probably think Queen's English. Well, actually, it's King's English now. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I know it will prompt for many of you imperial themes, empire. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm here at your gracious invitation and I'm humbled by that. And together, let's bow our knee to the Father who is the Father of every family in heaven and on earth. God is not only the universal Father, God is also the archetypal Father. That is to say, he's not only Father to us all, whether we like to use that title or not, he's the Father of whom all other fathers are derivatives and types. So far from regarding the divine fatherhood as a mode of speech in reference to the Godhead, derived by an analogy from our own conception of human fatherhood, what we have here is the other way around, the opposite. It's not that we extrapolate from our own experience of a father to glean what God is like, but the other way around. The very idea of human fatherhood exists because it exists primarily in the divine nature. We only know what fatherhood is because of God. God is the source of it wherever it is found. Human fathers, make sure your kids don't so much understand who God is from who you are. <laughs> Lord have mercy but that they understand who you understand yourself to be on the basis of who God is. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> make sure your kids don't come to understand what God is like on the basis of what you are like, but the other way around, they understand that your identity comes from God's identity. As fathers, actually this relates to mothers too, but anyway, I've written it down as fathers. 
you are imitating the heavenly father. God is not imitating you, please. (laughs) Right? I mean, that makes, yeah, that that really drives the point home, doesn't it? So this is a challenge for all of us about how we build our identity. Out of baptism, (laughs) yeah? Not out of the markers of identity that are at large in our society that then become the source of our hot button issues. So, where was I? We are only ever a pale imitation when it comes to fathers or mothers. The prototype is God, and our capacity to be a good one is about the way in which we take our lead from God, the extent to which we can imitate God and become godly in that role. I think that relates to father and mother as minister, as pastor, as priest, as well as parent. Now, where were we? Where was Paul? This is the father before whom Paul bows his knee before whom he prostrates himself. Are we surprised? If we understand more fully the God to whom we pray, I think more often we might fall on our faces in awe, in wonder, in longing, at God's greatness, at our smallness, in wonder that he should claim us, every single one of us, not a single person excluded. When there's silence in heaven, it is probably because besides every knee, so every jaw has hit the floor. Such is the realization that we are aghast. I'm going to pause for a moment. I know we haven't got very far. (laughs) Would you turn to your neighbor? And I think I'm just going to give you two minutes. So we haven't got very long. You're going to have to be really disciplined. Twos, not threes, okay? Because you won't have time to talk that way. I want to ask you, how does this speak to you thus far? And the God to whom you pray? Or perhaps I should say the God to whom you try to pray. And perhaps how you pray, including your posture. Okay, two minutes. I promise no plenary feedback, okay? You can be as honest as you like. Half a minute left.
Okay. Thank you, everyone. I am going to keep going. We can talk more over lunch, okay? Thank you. So we've talked about how Paul prays and to whom Paul prays. We still haven't got to the prayer, <laughs> okay? Or at least we haven't got to what Paul prays. What does he pray? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. One of two of you yelled out Trinity earlier, and here, here it is. The fa Paul prays that his father, the father of glory, the father of each and every family in heaven and on earth, that this mighty father would strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. First of all, Paul knows we are weak. Surprise, surprise. I, I mean, I, I do think pre-COVID, I think we might have said we were weak. And post-COVID, geez, are we feeling weaker? Yeah, I, I mean, I, in that sense, I think actually COVID is really helpful. Yes, we are weak. We were always weak. Pathetic, in fact. Aside from the God who calls us, empowers us and strengthens us. Let's not be afraid to be weak. It's a given. We are ever in need of strengthening. God is glorious and mighty and rich and we are weak and poor and flaky. <laughs> that is the human condition, not just post-COVID condition. It's okay. But it's not the divine condition. There is no scarcity with God. I heard somebody shout out abundance. It's all abundance. This is what the father of, ev of every family in heaven and on earth longs to do, to strengthen you and me in our inner beings. Notice there's a petition here for a gift of the Holy Spirit. How does God strengthen? With power through his spirit. Paul petitioned for a gift of the Spirit way back at, in chapter 1, verse 17, that the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So, of course, this echoes Jesus who promised the Holy Spirit to his disciples. The Father from heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Of course, those farewell narratives in John Jesus repeats and repeats the promise of the Holy Spirit to them in their fragility at that extreme moment of need. And then the risen Christ says, stay here until the Holy Spirit clothes you with power from on high. You know, how many times do we need to hear that message? You've preached it, but have you heard it? And how does the Holy Spirit strengthen us in a, in a, how does, where does the Holy Spirit strengthen us, sorry, in our inner being? In your inner being is the new creation inwardly established by the Spirit in those who, those who are united by faith to Christ. It's in tune with the mind of God. It delights in God's law. It's renewed from day to day, even when the outer mortal nature is wasting away. Romans 7, 2 Corinthians 4. I was thinking about that when Bishop Brewer was speaking about Earl. Earl, have I got the name right? Yeah. It's the immortal personality, which is the basis of the fuller immortality to be manifested in the resurrection age. That which we will fully know after this world in the next. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I'm going a little bit faster now, as you can tell. I'm looking at my watch. <laughs> the purpose of the strengthening, 
it, it's not so you can look strong, okay? <laughs> Who's interested in a pastor who looks strong? Well, people who want to be impressed by the outer nature. Forget that. The purpose of the strengthening of the gift of the Spirit, of the praying, is about Christ dwelling in us. The work of the Spirit is only and ever and all about Jesus. Some of the people that got impressed with the signs and wonders forgot about that, yeah? They want the flashy, the power, you know, the lights, the magic. The work of the Spirit is all about Jesus. Of course, it's because the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus which is made available to us from Jesus following his resurrection and ascension. The reason Jesus left following his mighty resurrection was in order that the Spirit might come. It would be better for us that way, Jesus said. You will be clothed from power from on high. Without that, if I stick around, you know, the Spirit, I need to go so the Spirit can come, so that I can be everywhere, so that I can strengthen your inner beings. He knew that we are better off with the Spirit working in and through each of us than with the physical presence of the person of Christ, because the Spirit has the capacity to work in every family on heaven and in earth. He, or should I say she, it's, it's feminine in Hebrew, is not limited by time and place. Hallelujah. We're reminded here about the work of the Spirit, perhaps especially in those corners of the church which focus on the work of the Spirit. There is danger we forget that the work of the Spirit is all about Jesus. That Jesus may dwell in your hearts through faith. The Spirit calls and equips. Through the Spirit, we're empowered, often in remarkable and surprising and miraculous ways, but not always, in the subtle ways too, to know, to pray, to heal, to listen, to reconcile, to build up, to challenge, to ad agitate is one of the, the gifts of the Spirit, to teach, to empower, to love. But all of those lovely gifts are for the building up of the body, the building up of the church, not the building up of its pastors, the building up of the body in order that together we may more fully embody and reflect the person of Christ in the body of Christ. Because we are self-oriented creatures, sinful beings in whom pride gets ahead of all else far too much of the time, I believe we need to be challenged, even with the gifts of God, to ensure that we are not hoarding them to ourselves. We're not using them to build up our fragile ego, God is not interested in my fragile ego or your fragile ego. God is interested in the whole body of Christ. Is there a danger that we think the Spirit is a gift to us, for us? That God's Spirit comes to heal us, to reassure us, to build us up so that we are less weak and more strong, so that we can be rich and not poor, so that we can impress others with our gifts and be successful in our work. Only you can assess whether that's a danger for you, personally and individually, but I would speak to the sense in which I think this is a danger for us corporately, ecclesially, as a church. You know, we want to look impressive. We want our numbers to speak for themselves. Or if our numbers aren't great, we want something else to speak for, for us. 
Hmm. We want to look strong. I don't know about, I can't speak for Florida. I, in Britain, in a, I would say, uh, a more secular context, we desperately want to look cool. I'm a bit embarrassed even saying that word because my, I was going to say my teenage children, they're on the cusp of their 20s now, say, Mum, please don't use that word. It's so embarrassing when it comes out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we can say it, but you can't. Yeah, I get that. So hear it from their mouth. You know, I want the church to look cool to them. And frankly, the harder we try, I think, the more cheesy we get sometimes. <laughs> we don't want to be sidelined in society, do we? W we question what is happening to our authority, the more secular society becomes. And I know it's happening your way too. I, I've lived here long enough. If we lose sight of the ball, if we lose sight of the purpose of the spirit, which is to point us to Christ, then the, to point us to Christ that we may glorify God, then we are in trouble. So I'd urge you to spend some time, uh, perhaps, perhaps in John, in, in the farewell words of Jesus, John chapter 15, his words to the disciples, when he speaks to them of the work of the Spirit. It's not about looking cool. It's about love. It's about being unified. It's about being faithful. It's about being willing to fail in a cause that will finally succeed than to succeed on something that will ultimately fail. What a waste of time. By the way, Israel, Paul knows perfectly well, Israel had the problem that they thought the work of the Spirit was for them, not for them to pass to others. Yeah? I, I, it's a relay race where the baton is to be passed on. God's gift of the Spirit is not a gift simply for the church. It's a gift through the church. It's one gigantic game of pass the parcel. Do you play that game? Kids parties? Not really. Okay, I'll have to explain it later. Hot potato. Is that the same thing? You keep the parcel moving. If you hang on to it, you, you pay a forfeit. Uh, there you go, hot potato. Thank you, I didn't know that. Very southern. <laughs> you don't get more southern than Florida? Is that fair? <laughs> That's not quite right. No, okay, 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 okay. Sorry. I'm dividing <laughs> in just the way I spoke of Paul uniting. Okay, sorry. I'm nearly there. I'm not going to get into more trouble. The strengthening for which Paul is praying is about Christ that he may dwell in your hearts by faith. So I've been throwing out a challenge, but I want to end on a note of reassurance, which we find here. Paul has already declared to the Ephesians, who were Gentiles, that they are in Christ. He's actually done it twice. We don't ever hear something first time, right? The ontological reality, in other words, what simply is, God is who they are, as Christians, they are grafted into the people of God. Get over yourselves, Gentiles. You're part of the people of God that was Israel and has now grown. And he's praying that the ontological reality, I'm sorry I'm using long words, that is about the reality of their being, will also be an existential reality, that it will play out in their self-understanding, in their experience, in their behavior, in the way they relate to others. Yeah? Who they are must dictate what they pray and what they do and how they shape the world before them. That is, they, that they may know the reality of being in Christ, of Christ dwelling in their hearts. In, in the letter to the Colossians that follows, Paul marvels 
how the indwelling of Christ in the Gentiles is the climax of the divine purpose. It's not just an add-on. It's where God was always going when he made that covenant with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, that you may be a blessing that everyone might be blessed through you, right? That baton hasn't reached its destination yet, folks. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 1, 27. So can we see the force of the phrase in faith or through faith, since it's only through faith that the Gentiles are partakers of Christ? Coupled with the faith, there is love. But we'll wait till this afternoon to talk about that, okay? And the way in which faith and love are bound up together. That word dwell, I just want to spend one more moment on that before I stop. That word dwell implies a sense that Christ will take up residence in your hearts. There are two very similar Greek words for dwelling. Do you want the Greek? Okay. Parakeo and katakeo. The first, parakeo, is the weaker one. It's to be a visitor. It's to come to the Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center for two nights, okay? I may or may not unpack my suitcase, but I'm a visitor. I'm a guest. I may be a stranger, even if I'm welcomed, okay? The second is much more unusual, katakeo. In Paul, it's about settling down somewhere. It's about taking on a new permanent address. It's about residing without ever moving house again. It's about unpacking the suitcase and throwing the suitcase away because you won't need it again. It's used metaphorically for the fullness of the Godhead abiding in Christ, dwelling in Christ, and for Christ's abiding in the believer's heart here in Ephesians 3.17. So what we have here is the one time forever aspect, okay? This is the word used in 3.17, and it's underlined by the tense, anyone who's learnt Greek. You remember the aorist? It's a one-time deal. It's completed action, okay? Christ has come to dwell in your hearts. Get the message. If Christ is here, he's here to stay. Christ didn't leave when lockdown happened and you felt alone. Okay, I could sum up what I've said, but I'm worried about time because noon prayer is going to be at noon. (laughs) It it was going to be at 11.45, but we fixed that. And I really want... I can do some summarizing depending on the questions, okay? But I really want to make sure this is interactive because you'll get fed up of listening to me over the next two days if I don't do that. So where is, is it Christy? Cynthia. Cynthia, so sorry. I've forgotten your name already. Cynthia has been collecting questions. But first, as a South Carolinian by birth, you have to go north to hit south. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> so, so, so in Florida, you don't say all oh, y'all. Oh, yeah. oh, you do. <laughs> that, thank uh, you. We can talk later about what defines the South. Yeah, then. Okay. You, you can teach me. Thank you, Cynthia. So, Bishop Wells, can you translate what everything you've said <laughs> looks like in day in and day out ministry, especially when we have a secularized society who either ignores the church or is hostile to it? It's just a small question there. (laughs) (laughs) I I have an answer. (laughs) I, I was wondering about whether to talk about this. What we have in Ephesians 3, 14 to 17, in my book, is an Anglican collect. Mm. 
In other words, the first, uh, I'm, not, I'm looking at the screen only to find my verse, but I can find it here. The first section of the prayer focuses on who God is and what God has done. The second section of the prayer makes a petition. The third section of the prayer is a doxology that we come to tomorrow that is about, you know, God will blow your mind. You know, pray what the heck you like <laughs> as long as you've allowed the spirit to flex your muscles so that they can, they're elastic. Because whatever you've asked, God's going to do way more. So, uh, and, and last time I looked in your book of common prayer, just as in mine, we have those beautiful colics that uh, uh, originate from Thomas Cranmer, where every single prayer begins with an affirmation of who God is and what God has done. You know, it doesn't say, hi God, here I am, please can I have a parking space? <laughs> you know, just to go back to my old argument with my friend. It, 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 it <laughs> In other words, we're doing some theology when we pray. A actually, that's exactly what Bishop Brewer said this morning, lex orandi, lex credendi, right? How we believe impacts how we pray. And here, we're voicing what we believe. You know, in a, if you like, we're telling God who God is. <laughs> that's what Paul is doing. And of course, actually, because he's writing down his pray, prayer, he's teaching us at the same time, yeah? then making a petition and then closing it with a mind-boggling, hey God, you know, you're God, amen. Uh, I can't remember what the question was. How do, we, <laughs> how do we live and move in an increasingly secular age? I don't think we can do it without a grounding in prayer. We will just run out of gas. I mean, th that's why, call me old-fashioned, I, I wanted to do some Bible with you. It's not just, but well, it's probably why I, I, I did a PhD in Bible, <laughs> not in theology. I would have got lost. I would have, get, you know, uh, for me, we just have to plug back in at most basic level. A and th that then begins to adjust our thinking, our talking, our, our worldview, the unconscious ways we live as well as the conscious ways we live. I'm talking about an ethic of virtue. It's not about yeah. the decisions we make. It's about, heck, it's what somebody notices about you when you're having a bad day, you hope. Because the Spirit is strengthening you and indwelling in you for the sake of the person of Christ. That's how we live I in, our, yeah. in our secular world. Okay? Wonderful. Is there any connection between dwell in 317 to the tabernacle? Yeah. Well, nice one, nice one, nice one. I, it's not... Mm. I'm going to have to go back to a Greek Bible, and I don't have one with me here. Somebody else can do that work here. Get onto Bible Gateway or whatever. Um, it is, I, I, I'm going to take a gamble here. I don't think it's the same word. So John chapter 1, and Jesus dwelt among us. Uh, 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 yes, it, it's skene. It's the word for tent. Jesus tented with us, mm -hmm. which is the word for Old Testament tabernacle, if you look at the uh, Septuagint. Um, and it's the same word in Revelation, but I... I think we're talking a, diff a slightly different concept, actually. We just use the same word in English. That's a bit of a gamble. Somebody else knows better here. Please stand up and come up to the microphone. I'll do my homework for you before tomorrow. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Love it. Love it. I can't wait to hear this one. What are implications that the Holy Spirit is feminine? <laughs> <laughs> What are the implications, you know, to the idea that God has a feminine side, you know, I mean, God the Father has a feminine side as well. Uh, you know, uh, uh, God is beyond gender. L let's just establish that once for all, okay? 
the problem is that our language is very limited. Um, and your BCP, that, that would be the main reason for tiny revision to the BCP in my book. Just feels like it's unfortunate when it was published. I think it's a brilliant BCP and I love it. And I actually don't long for you to revise much at all. Mm. Your confession goes deeper than any confession in our uh, modern day versions of the BCP in the Church of England. So thank you for that. I love it. Um, uh, how did I get onto the BCP? Sorry. <laughs> the, s the implications of the f spirit being feminine. I, I mean, I could throw out a few ideas, but I fear they'd be controversial because there's a danger in doing so, we reinforce gender stereotypes mm -hmm. in the process. And I, I, for myself, I, I just, ge you know, gender stereotypes are proved to be incorrect when you meet the exception to the rule. Yeah? Uh, w but we do it because our, we've got pea-sized brains and we just can't <laughs> cope with the level of diversity of God's world. And I just think, you know, we need to be humbled. We need to bow the knee. We need to pay homage because we're too small-minded. But if, if, you, if you want me to keep going, even so, what are the implications that the spirit has feminine qualities? Um, you know, perhaps I would say the spirit... Well, no, I don't even want to say that. Do you know, when... I, I, I was ordained in the very first wave of female priests in the Church of England back in 94, 95. And, and I, I was a young student then, so I kind of came in on the back of other people's hard work <laughs> and campaigning. But I remember in the campaign, can you believe this? People saying, once we have women in the clergy, we'll break down the hierarchy. Exactly. I mean, it's ridiculous <laughs> because women don't seek power. I I'm really sorry. Women play games of power, too. <laughs> they're just sometimes different games. Sometimes they're more subtle. Perhaps they're not so muscular. I don't know. But uh, I, I just think women sin just as much. Anyway, that <laughs> money, sex and power just takes on different takes in a feminine guise. Anyway, I was going to say, I think the spirit always points to Christ. The spirit doesn't point to itself. There's a question over there. Okay, that'll do for an answer. Let's leave it there. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful answer. Thank I, you. I could, I could say more, but let's keep going, shall we? We have time for one last question. Okay. And I'm going to read it directly. This person's question is about through, the terminology through the spirit. It sounds like I'm hearing you speak of it as being in the spirit, but I read through as a separate clause. Please help me understand what it means to be strengthened with power. So have fun with that. <laughs> please, just that last phrase, please tell me how... Please help me understand what it means to be strengthened with power. With our? Power. Oh, power. power. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's the accent. I think, I'm not sure I'm going to answer that question in some, it sounds like a more philosophical, mm -hmm. philological question. I'm going to just answer it theologically. Um, to be strengthened with power clearly demonstrates that power does not come from us. Let's just hear that once for all. Um, and it's okay, it seems to me, if you feel powerless, therefore. You know, you're facing the reality. But we are here to receive and reflect divine power. S 
So we have to get over ourselves. Now that's a phrase I learned in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I often preach that in England. It, it, anyway. Um, we have to get over ourselves so that we are God's agent and not, it's not Joe Bailey Wells here. You know, I'm not interested, yeah. We have to get used to the idea of being weak is okay. Um, what does it mean to be strengthened with power? I, I think we need to re-engage with scripture in what power looks like. And that is where, you know, our secular context has infected the church in such a way that we've adopted something uncritically. Jesus has power. He, he has the, the fullness of, of, of God, the creator, God, the redeemer. And look, look what happens. That power is shared, that power is given to others, to the woman with the hemorrhage, the one bent double, the one who's been lying by a pool for 18 years. A and Jesus himself presents most of the time as powerless. That is what we should expect power to be and to mean. That is, that is where I long we may be strengthened. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, continue to text them in, and we'll make sure that they get to Bishop Wells to address. Your Thank questions you so are much. challenging. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. It feels such a blessing to be here. Okay, and now to noonday prayer.